Welcome to New Life Glenside. Good morning. My name is Alden Groves. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator here at New Life. And it's, it's just a joy to have you with us here to worship this morning, to celebrate our Savior, not only who came to live among us, who died, but who rose again in glory. That's, that's what we're really here to worship. Um, I'm about to lead us in our call to worship, and this comes from Revelation chapter 1. In just a, just a second, I'll ask you to stand as I read. But before I do that, I wanted to set just a little bit of context here for, for why we're reading this and, and how this ought to prepare our hearts to sing praise and, and to hear the word preach that Ben is about to preach from 1 Corinthians 15. We're in this series on the resurrection, uh, the, the truth of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, the good news and the glory of the resurrection. And what I'm about to read for us in Revelation chapter 1, it's, it's the Apostle John sort of before he really gets into the fullness of this, this vision he has in Revelation, it's, it's him encountering the risen and resurrected Lord in all his glory and his power and his might. And John has this response where he just falls down in fear and terror, which is frankly the right response. Um, but it, it's fascinating. I, I want you to look at the picture we're given of this resurrection body and, and the glory and the amazingness of Jesus as, as the resurrected Lord. And that's really, Ben is going to talk about this resurrection body we're going to have today. But I also want you to think about the words that Jesus says to John. Uh, particularly, he says, fear not. And the reality is John has the right response where he falls down as dead almost and is terrified. Because this should be a moment of judgment and wrath and scary, scary things. But instead, he speaks tenderly and he talks about how he has overcome death itself. If our Lord has conquered death, the scariest thing this world has to throw at us, what is there left to be afraid of? And how can we not turn and respond and worship to our Lord? So if you will, stand now. You watching online, stand, uh, stand from your couch uh, <laughs> and hear this call to worship from Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 12 to 18. This is what scripture tells us. John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the great roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the, sh the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then listen to this. What this sharp two-edged sword of a tongue says. It says, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. That is our powerful Lord, a resurrected Lord who is calling us into glory. In him we have nothing left to fear. So let us praise him with full hearts and raised voices. Amen. Defender 
You have received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And we, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I'm excited to announce that we got a, a baptism this morning, um, so I'm going to invite uh, the Chungs, Paul and Silly up, uh, if they're, are they ready? <laughs> and then uh, also the elders, if there's any elders in the room, uh, please come forward. Um, yeah, <laughs> we caught them off guard. <laughs> um, all right, well, um, I... I had the privilege of, of getting to know the, the Chungs a bit more. Um, they invited me over for lunch and, uh, and fed me tacos, which is always a plus in my book. So, you know, I like these guys. <laughs> uh, definitely recommend their cooking, too. Um, no, this is a wonderful family. Uh, they've been a part of our church for a number of years, and um, it's just such a blessing to uh, have them here to get to, to baptize London. Um, but first, before we do that, I want to ask a question that often gets asked, um, especially in Presbyterian circles. Why do we baptize infants? 
Um, and it has a lot to do with uh, actually what we're talking about in the series, the resurrection. Baptism is a sign, a symbol of what happens uh, when Jesus was raised from the dead. It's, it's a symbol of you being united to Christ's death and resurrection. And interestingly enough, so was circumcision in the Old Testament. And uh, so I want to read to you Colossians 2, chapter, or chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It says this, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your, uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses." So baptism depicts you dying, you're dying and rising with Christ through an actual cleansing with water, a putting off of the uncleanliness of sin, and a putting on of the, the cleanness, the righteousness of Christ. And same with circumcision, it's a putting off of the dead flesh of the old man, the death of Christ, and then a putting on of Christ raised in power. And because of these two things represent the same spiritual realities, in the same way that we circumcised infants in the Old Testament, we baptize uh, infants in the New Testament. And if you had any uh, you know, further doubt about that, Paul, or Peter makes it clear in, in Acts chapter 2. He says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children. And for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And Peter is actually quoting from Genesis chapter 17, where circumcision is instituted. So he's making a direct connection between baptism and circumcision. And maybe you guys haven't thought of that quite that way, but th this is really about the resurrection. It's about a, a resurrection hope that you and I have that infants that we raise in the Lord will grow in their faith and profess faith when they grow older. It's, it's that hope that we want to invite them into the church and raise them in the faith. So with that, I have some questions for you guys. Um, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf? And do you look in the faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? We do. <laughs> do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with and for her that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy religion and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up by, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. All right. <laughs> um, now, got one question for you as a congregation. Do you, as a congregation, undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? All right. So... What is your child's name? London Chung. London Chung. Can I? Or? She might cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Hey, London. London, look. These are all your family members. This is your new family you're going to spend eternity with. Oh, yeah. She's crying. Here. We'll do it this way. Yeah. yeah. I woke her up. London. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. And uh, Steve, w would, you, uh, would you mind um, closing us in prayer?
Father, we thank you for your creation and then thank you for your ordination that uh, you've given to us to multiply in Christ Jesus. And uh, we pray that uh, we thank you for the uh, London child. And then, the, uh, Father, I pray that the, uh, you mightily bless her in, his in her life and then the, uh, she will beautifully grow in Christ. And then shower her with your grace, shower her with your spirit. And then the, uh, as she uh, grows up, and then she will come to know Jesus deeply, follow him, and then the, uh, she will make you uh, the, the profession of faith, and then the, uh, she will obey Jesus Christ, his command in her life. We pray for the family, and then the, uh, Paul and Sylvia, Father, we pray that the, uh, make them strong, give them wisdom, knowledge they need at the given moments, and then the, uh, they will guide and lead London and other children to Christ Jesus. We thank you again for your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning, New Life. My name is Caitlin Valla, and I have the pleasure of being your junior high ministry leader here. Um, I'm here to bring you some announcements, but first, would those receiving the offering please come forward? Your gifts given now are online support God's work of ministry and missions through New Life, and we praise God for his gift to us and letting us honor him in our giving. Let's pray. Lord, my rock and redeemer, thank you that you are in infinitely, consistently, and perfectly wise. You have said that whatever we give is acceptable if we give it eagerly. You have said that we should give according to what we have. Help us to bring our offerings with an eager heart, not as a comparison with others, but as an act of worship to you. May we find the comfort we desire in you and the strength we need in your name. May you be with us every moment of our day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. First announcement is for tonight. So come and enjoy an authentic Indian dinner presented by Helping India Together tonight at 5.30. For only $8, you participate in this complete meal and will get an update on what's happening in India. Presented by the HIT team, who has just recently returned from there, your contributions will help with our involvement in India. Next, Kenny Owens is seeking organizers, helpers, builders, musicians, planners, and walkers to plan, develop, and participate in New Life's entry into the Greater Glenside Fourth of July Parade. You can be involved in this as much or as little as you have time to be. The bigger our presence in the parade, the better our visibility to the Glenside community. Able Life, New Life's ministry to those with special needs, will host a special needs ministry training event, Disability 101, Becoming an Irresistible Church, Saturday, May 20th in the Fellowship Hall from 1 to 3 p.m. The speaker is Sib Charles, Ministry Relations Manager for Joni and Friends. That's it on announcements this morning. So this is the time. Stand up, stretch, say hello, wave across the room, and when that music starts, please go back to your seats.
to. As we uh, go to prayer this morning, I'd invite you to reflect on some of the words of Psalm 16. This is a um, prayer of David's. Um, hard to know what part of his life this is referring to exactly, but um, he must be in some kind of trouble based on verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And then as he goes on further, um, Let's also reflect on this, uh, imagining Jesus uh, himself praying these words, as all the Psalms, um, this is a key to getting deeper into them. Jesus, the, the last Adam, the, 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 the final uh, perfect man, representative of all of us. We know we're able to do this in this particular Psalm, we're invited to do this by Peter in Acts 2 as he quotes this, uh, reflecting on the resurrection. 
Um, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to the place of the dead, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we, we uh, bring to you um, our hearts this morning as we reflect on these words, and we, we want to lift up especially all those um, around the world who are in times of distress and trouble and uh, deep, uh, deep difficulty, and uh, we, come, we come to you before that. Um, at the same time, Lord, there is, uh, there is this inheritance that you promise us and uh, referred to even in this psalm. I didn't read that verse, but, but uh, Lord, we, um, we rejoice as well, Lord, uh, in, the, in the inheritance that we have through Jesus, through his, uh, his finished work. What a joy it is to reflect on that today. Um, and um, to welcome also into uh, your family uh, this uh, new covenant child this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your uh, steadfast blessings and care for all of us. We, we think of those uh, who are uh, far off in uh, places of war, uh, not only uh, Ukraine, we've been praying for, for the situation there, but uh, th these last few weeks in Sudan as well. Um, Lord, would you have mercy on the many, many people there who are, uh, who are caught in the midst of these, uh, these terrible difficulties. Would you bless those who are uh, especially working to bring humanitarian relief in this time and, and, uh, and, and aid, and um, those who are trying to work for peace. We pray for, um, pray for our missionaries. We thank you for um, uh, the, the testimony in the first service of David de Asagar of uh, Hebron Believers Assembly. And uh, we, we pray, Lord, for, uh, for that work in India of national church planners and, and really all the, all the work of, uh, of our brothers and sisters in India who are working to spread the gospel there. Um, thank you. We get to hear about some of that tonight at the, uh, at the, at the uh, dinner. Um, Lord, would you uh, especially give them great boldness in this time of increased persecution and uh, Lord, would you even use this persecution, Lord, as a, as a powerful witness to the, the power of the resurrected Christ and, uh, and, and give power to their words of, of testimony, we pray in Jesus' name there. Uh, we lift up to you those in close to home, Lord, who are um, uh, suffering, Lord. Our, our brother Stephen uh, Smallman, uh, brother and father, went into the hospital a couple of days ago. We pray for um, wisdom of the, for the doctors to, to understand what's going on, why he has such extreme fatigue. Lord, we pray you'd bring him back soon to us. And we pray for his wife, Sandy, and uh, his family, Lord, as they uh, uh, just uh, seek to um, respond to these uh, developments, Lord, uh, uh, in this time. Be, be very near to all of them, we pray. Um, we thank you for our sister Lorraine uh, Smith, Lord. We pray for her as she goes into for a, a lumpectomy this week uh, for surgery. Thank you, Lord, that they, they caught this early, and uh, we pray, Lord, that you would restore her quickly to, to full health for us. Um, we pray for uh, others who are suffering in our midst, Lord, um, uh, with chronic or longer-term conditions. Uh, for our sister Carolyn Ritter, we pray you'd Help them to understand quickly what's, uh, what's going on with their headaches. Uh, for, our, for those who are grieving, Lord, we continue to pray for our sister Tanya as she uh, just uh, deals with uh, the passing of her son, Sherby. Um, for um, others who uh, have lost uh, those that they, they love dearly this uh, past, uh, past recent times, uh, for uh, Chris Bauer, Lord, uh, mourning the death of his, um, his grandparent, and uh, for the Walt sisters, Lord, as uh, they suddenly lost their cat this week, Lord, would you comfort them in this time? Lord, we um, lift up to you those who are uh, in need of work and, um, or who are underemployed, Lord, we pray that you would um, 
help them to find that, uh, that next job, uh, that next uh, step in life. Uh, some of our folks are um, maybe younger, just kind of trying to figure out where they ought to be uh, uh, headed employment-wise, Lord, and we pray that you would uh, connect them, Lord, uh, with their, uh, uh, yeah, with, with stable work, with um, something that uh, will um, enable them to, uh, to um, discover that vocation, Lord, that you have called each of them to. Um, we pray likewise for all of us, Lord, as we uh, just consider our, our church finances, Lord, we pray for the budget committee that you would help them to, uh, as they labor and serve us this uh, next month, to continue trying to hammer out where, um, where our next year's uh, fiscal year's church budget ought to be that we need to uh, adopt in June. And now, Lord, we, we uh, just lift up to you our um, uh, uh, Ben again as he comes to, to preach his sermon. Lord, we pray that it would touch our hearts, um, uh, that uh, we would um, come out of this um, knowing and loving you more, um, more and more, and um, knowing that power of the risen Christ uh, in our own lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I have, I have a question for you all. Um, have you ever been told that you're not good at something? <laughs> yeah, it seems to be a universal experience. Um, or maybe you've been told affectionately, yeah, don't quit your day job. Um, I don't know why, but when people look at me, they, they often assume that I'm good at basketball. <laughs> I, I don't, for life of me, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> so you know, you ever like crumple up a piece of paper and you try and like toss it into a trash can and like nine times out of ten you totally miss? Like, well, okay, you guys maybe make it more than I am. <laughs> so I did this once, I totally missed, and my friend goes to me, he's like, yeah, you you should not play basketball. <laughs> and uh, at the moment that it happened, it didn't really bother me. I've never been good at basketball. I've always known this. Uh, tall, lanky, but uncoordinated. Um, so it, I kind of just brushed it off. And, and maybe you guys have had things like that too. We all get comments where it's like, yeah, yeah, all right. Well, I wasn't really trying to be good at that, so it's not a big deal. Um, but if someone comes to you and, and says you're, you're bad at your job that you do full time, that's different right? That, that's going to hit you probably more close to home because you've put a lot of effort into uh, honing your skills in that area, right? And um, I think a lot of times these statements can be pretty impactful. For me, I was really impacted by comments like this when it came to school. So when I grew up through elementary school to high school, I had an average GPA of about 2.8, which is a little below average, you, you know, <laughs> add that up. And um, a lot of that, I realized later, was um, the way people were talking to me, they're like, yeah, you're, you're not really academically gifted, you know, is the way people would talk. And by the time I was in college, though, my GPA jumped to a 4.0. And it wasn't anything about my IQ. It was the way people talked to me and talked about me and encouraged me that made the difference. Uh, it was people coming alongside me saying, no, Ben, I think you got more of a gifting here than you realize. Uh, now, I'm not saying that if you guys come up to me after the sermon and are like, Ben, you're actually really good at basketball. Why, that, that's not going to magically make me good at basketball. That's not the point. But there are a lot of times where we don't try things or we are convinced that we can't do something simply because other people have told us that. Um, and so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 39 through 49. It's in page 962, um, if you're tracking along in your uh, Black Pew Bible. And um, I just want, before we read that passage, just like a lot of um, the, the naysayers that I had to deal with uh, when it came to school, the Corinthians had to deal with a lot of naysayers when it comes to the resurrection. In Corinth, um, they thought of the body more as a prison that your soul was to be freed from. So they didn't think that 
the resurrection was possible or even desirable. Like, why would you want to be raised to new life in your body? You, that defeats the whole purpose. And then you had uh, Jewish believers in Corinth who were equally naysaying, saying, well, how could it be that a poor carpenter's son from Nazareth is the Messiah of the world? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so you had all these, these naysayers that were really affecting the church in Corinth. And even today, we have, especially today, a lot of naysayers that we deal with as a church. Um, it's really common. I remember there was an Arcadia student that I uh, talked to, me being a campus minister, talking to this Arcadia student I've never met before. And I you know, started you know, sharing the gospel with him and talking to him. He's like, yeah, man, not interested. What does that communicate? It's the world, it communicates that the world really sees the church as irrelevant, not powerful, kind of weak, uh, fading away, dying. Uh, the church, we often get the message, is bigoted, hateful, corrupt. Um, and the list goes on of all these different negative views of the church that we get. And there is some truth to some of those things, but I think the tragedy in it is that we've bought a lot of what the world says about the church. And it's not because the world has better arguments. It's because they speak with greater conviction. So my challenge for you this morning is to speak with greater conviction and confidence in the hope that you have in the resurrection. You can do more, a lot more, than the world thinks that you can. Um, and so that's how I want to encourage you this morning. And um, with that, let's read this, this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 39 to 49. It says this, For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are from heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So here's the main point that this text has for you today. The resurrection is the most powerful and important force in all existence. More powerful than anything else in the universe. And this resurrection power, this force, is living in you and at work in you even today. And we see the, the power of the resurrection in this text in three ways. We see it uh, that the resurrection is the most glorious events in, uh, to ever occur. We see that all of history points towards the resurrection. And we see that the resurrection is the center of the Christian life. If you're following along, if you look at your bulletin, there's an outline there. It puts it this way. It says there's, there's a resurrection glory, a resurrection history, and a resurrection ethic. And we're going to go through those one by one. So first we have a, a resurrection glory. And this is seen in verses 39 through 44. Uh, and in verses 39 and 40, we get a list of all these different kinds of bodies in creation. It's kind of, it might seem strange to you. Like, what is this getting at? It describes bodies of animals, birds, humans, uh, as well as bodies in um, space, like the sun, the moon, the stars. And each of these is described as having its own level of glory. Um, so there's different sort of 
uh, bodies that have more glory and those bodies that have less. But before I get into what a glorious, the glory of these bodies is, I think it's important to def define what glory is. Have you guys ever thought of what, what glory actually is? How do you define it? It's one of those words that permeates. It's, the scriptures are filled with this word. And it's so common that we hear it. I don't think we can really think about what it means. It can be kind of hard to define. Put simply, glory is something that makes you stick out. It can be a talent that you have or something that you are just really good at or uh, something about you, about your personality or something. There's a glory to those things. And so the same way Paul is saying there's a glory to these different bodies in creation. There's uh, a glory of, of the sun. The glory of the sun comes from the fact that it allows us to see. <laughs> it's really bright in the sky and shines its light across the whole earth. The moon, similarly, is, it's less prominent in the sky, but it still shapes the tides of the oceans and different things like that. It has a unique glory to it in that way. The stars are the same way. And similarly, uh, different animals have different kinds of glory. Like the glory of birds is to fly. I can't fly, um, but birds can't. And that's something they sort of bring that, that is unique in certain ways to them. So the glory of, of mankind is really interesting because the glory of man is the image of God. It's that you are made in God's image. That is a glorious thing because it's something that nothing else in creation has. And the image of God, if you um, just a, a refresher in that concept, is that you represent God to creation. That the image of God is imprinted on you and you are um, actually reigning with God over creation. And there's a representation that you have, a, a very honorable position. That's the glory of, of this image of God. So Paul's point is that the resurrection body of Christ is just like this. It has a certain level of glory. Except what he's pointing out is the resurrection body of Christ is even more glorious than the sun. It has an unsurpassed glory. Why? Like what makes it glorious? Well, he points out three different things. He says, first, the resurrection, of, uh, the resurrection body of Christ is imperishable. What does that mean? Well, perishable, you can think of like a perishable good, like bread or something that gets moldy and expires and you gotta toss it out. Um, our bodies are perishable. They age, they wear out, they eventually expire. But the resurrection body of Jesus is imperishable. It does not grow old. It does not... Uh, lose any um, energy or, or health. So that's one thing. The second thing is power. It says, um, you know, it's raised in, it's sown in weakness, raised in power. This resurrection body has power. What kind of power is he talking about? Well, think back uh, to when Jesus was raised from the dead. He had some pretty impressive abilities when he was raised. He could walk through walls. He could basically teleport himself to different places wherever he wanted. And even more impressive, he had the ability to ascend in his body to heaven. That is pretty incredible. Um, and then the last part is that Christ's resurrection body is spiritual. So it's, it's a spiritual body. And that seems odd to us because we often put body and spirit as two separate things. So, so what does it mean to, to have a spiritual body? So Paul describes this natural body, which is the body that you and, ha and I have now. And the spiritual body is the, the body of Christ. It, what he's saying is our natural bodies represent creation. Our spirit, these spiritual bodies of resurrection represent new creation. Just as there was a first creation, there is a renewed second creation. And these bodies belong to almost like a different universe, a different dimension. That's what he's saying. And, and the other aspect of the spiritual body is that, as we see in verse 45, it is life-giving. That's why uh, Paul describes Christ, the last Adam, as becoming a life-giving spirit. Spiritual bodies don't just have life, they give life. There's a unique glory to this. Okay. So here's one of the other things that, that this means. That 
Adam was always meant to have a spiritual resurrection, new creation body. It's not something alien or completely foreign to the created world. There, the world was always meant to develop into this. This is what Paul says. He says, it is sown perishable. The body is sown perishable. It is raised imperishable. The bo natural body is a seed. When Adam was created, you can think of it as a seed. And when a seed grows into a plant, what happens to the seed? It, it disappears, right? The seed has to go away for the plant to sprout and grow and develop. So you can think of um, the natural body as a seed that is planted and the spiritual body as a plant that swallows up the seed and sprouts up out of the ground, right? That's the image that Paul is giving you. So what that means is that really creation was always supposed to have this spiritual nature, this resurrection power, raise this plant that would grow out from the seed of the natural body. And that would have happened if Adam had obeyed God in the Garden of Eden. But because Adam disobeyed God and sinned, the development of that seed of creation was cut off. It was stopped. And so what there, was, what there needed to happen was there had to be a new seed to restart the growth because the first seed was dead before it could grow. And that's exactly what we see in Genesis 3.15. If you read that verse, it says that there's a promised seed of Eve that will come and crush the head of the serpent and will end the reign of death and end the reign of sin and restart this growth from the natural body to the spiritual body. All right, so that's a pretty big idea. And I would encourage you guys to chew on that more. But the point the reason why this is relevant to your lives today is that living in this community that is made possible by the resurrection, it's a resurrection community, means viewing the world through a lens of hope and not despair. I don't know about you, but whenever I watch the news, it's hard not to get the, the distinct impression that the sky is falling and that everything is getting progressively worse. Um, no matter what news source you're looking at, there seem to all be in agreement that things are bad, right? And um, I think it's easy to fall into that negativity, that, that the world is falling apart, that everything is going to decay and rot and fall away. But we are called not to fall into that negativity, that cynicism when we view the world. And a great example, I, I was really encouraged by this, even at this church. It was the way we handled this, this new building, the building, the, the renovations and all the improvements to this building that we did. We came together and had numerous conversations, put tons of resources together. And we had, you know, a hundred thousand different opinions on what the building should look like, how much money we should raise, different decisions here and there. And yet we were willing to put all that aside. Why? Because we believed we had hope that something good could happen from our efforts. There was a belief, a hope that this building could be something bigger and better than what it was before. I mean, imagine if we had looked at it through a, a lens of negativity and basically said, this building's a lost cause. We just need to get a different one or move to a different space. Like, this is not gonna work. It's rotting, there's too many problems with it. Like, we're, we're not gonna come together and do any of this. If we had that kind of attitude towards this building. Nothing would have gotten done because we've internalized this belief that it's impossible. And so the same thing can happen in the world. We, we see different things in the world and we look at it through the lens of the world, believing that this world is all there is. That there's no hope that this world is going to end in decay. But if we really believe in the resurrection, that means believing that this world is not all there is. There is a new and better world to come. And um, I just want to encourage you that um, while we do want to be countercultural, Marx talked about this a number of times in a, in a number of ways, we don't want to be counter creational. We want to believe in, like, we know that this is true, that good always wins out in the end. Even though it might look 
like the world, it, evil is going to win. It won't. It can't. Evil in the world is incapable of destroying the good. It can only distort it. That's something really important to remember. All right, so we got that. We also have a resurrection history. And it's not only is the resurrection more glorious than anything else, but it's also, uh, there's also a resurrection history. All of history points forward and backward to the resurrection of Jesus. And we see this in verse 45. It says this, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay, so we've mentioned this before. So we get who this, the first Adam is. It's Adam in the Garden of Eden, right? That makes sense. Who's the last Adam then? And if you're thinking the traditional church answer, you're right. It's Jesus. Jesus is the last Adam. You, you got it right. It's not a trick question. And in verse 45, what, what is happening here is Adam is representing not just all of humanity. He is representing the era, as, we've, as I just described, of this natural body, the natural world that we see around us. The first creation. The last Adam represents an era of new creation. The last creation when everything is fully perfected, um, when this plant grows and consumes the seed and fully develops. That's what he's, he's getting at. So what Paul is saying is that Christ becomes a life-giving spirit, um, or what Paul elsewhere calls the first fruits of the resurrection. He's kicking off this new era of history where there's a, a growth in, um, from the seed to the plant. Okay, there's two big theological ideas that I, I want to get across to you next. And that is, Christ is, not only was, but also is your representative. And Christ not only was, but is the representative of Adam. What do I mean by that? Well, a couple weeks ago, we talked about how Adam, Mark explained how Adam is an accurate representative of what you and I would do in the Garden of Eden. Meaning, if I was in the Garden of Eden and I was put in the exact same circumstance as Adam, I would have done what Adam did. I would have sinned and fallen into temptation just like he did. And I know that because I fall into temptation every day. <laughs> and um, so that's how Adam represents you. Christ, though, represents you in a much more powerful way because he doesn't represent you in doing what you would have done. He represents you in doing what you should have done. And it gets even um, more incredible than that. Adam doesn't represent you also in the same way as Christ because you only are represented by Adam in his first sin. So after Adam sinned, he was kicked out of the garden, right? That means that once he was kicked out of the garden, he is no longer your representative. That's why you are accounted guilty for Adam's first sin, but not his second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, etc. So after, that, after the fall, he is no longer your representative. Here's, here's where it gets cool. Christ, on the other hand, represents you not only in one of his righteous deeds, but in all of them. Not just in his life, not just in his death, not just in his resurrection, not just in his ascension, but even now, as he represents you at the right hand of the Father, all of that righteousness, it's like a tidal wave of righteousness is given to you, not just a single sin as in the case of Adam. And it, that's how sure your standing in Christ is. Your righteousness that's in Christ cannot be taken away from you because Christ is living right now at the right hand of the Father, representing you right now. He not only became a life-giving spirit, he is a life-giving spirit. He not, it's not just something that he became in the past. He still is and always will be. Okay. Um, and it gets even bigger when you realize that Christ is Adam's representative. Meaning that once Adam stopped being a representative and sinned and fell from grace, he needed himself a representative to redeem him. And that was Jesus. The resurrection is so powerful that it brought Adam from death to life. 
It redeemed Adam from sin. And every saint in the Old Testament, it's the same way. Noah, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon, the prophets, whoever you name, that person is redeemed by the power of the resurrection of Jesus. Really think about that. that you can kind of think of the resurrection like a giant boulder being chucked into a lake. It impacts with such force that there's ripples that go throughout all the lake. It, there's ripples that go backward and forward in time. There is no point in time that can escape the rescuing power of Christ's resurrection. That is amazing to think about. Christ always has been, always is, and always will be your perfect representative and your perfect redeemer. And here's another point of how this relates to your life. What does this mean for you? It means that even now, Christ is in heaven, reigning on your behalf. The most powerful force in the universe, in existence, is got your back. <laughs> That's incredible to think about. It's, it's for you, that Christ is for you. He is on your side. And Hebrews 7.25 says it this way. He says, Christ is able to save forever those who draw near to God because he always lives to make intercession for them. Christ is not only was, but again, is still a life-giving spirit who is in heaven, giving you life at every moment, renewing your life, giving you strength, giving you resources. So it's because of that we can say that the resurrection is not just a powerful event in the past and a future hope, but a living and present power. So I just want to say briefly, don't underestimate the heavenly resurrection resources that you have at your disposal. Um, example for me is last past week, I had a, a pretty intense week. I, I worked well over 70 hours. And um, I don't say that to, to brag about how hard I'm working, but to say I needed God's grace to make it through this past week. Uh, and I needed his strength. And I needed to, to access these heavenly resources as it felt like all these things were happening in my life that um, were unexpected. And maybe you've had weeks like that, or maybe even now you're feeling just overworked, overwhelmed, exhausted. Maybe you're unsure of where money is going to come from for different things or unsure about decisions that you're trying to make or your health is taking a, a turn for the worse or whatever it is, whatever is going on in your life, you can know that Christ is reigning on your behalf now and that he loves you and that he's willing to give you anything you need to persevere through whatever you're going through. Uh, all you have to do is ask. He is able to give you strength. And I think one of the things for me that I've realized is I've had to accept I am not, nor should I necessarily be, the hardest working person that I know. That can really be a source of pride in my heart. Um, and just as much as there are weeks like last week where it's time to step up my game and, and really work harder than I normally would or thought that I could, there are lots of weeks where God is blessing me with times to rest. And the response to that should not be, well, I'm lazy, I need to work harder. The response should be, God, thank you for this gift. That in itself, is a, it's a resource from heaven, a gift, a blessing for you to rest in Christ. You don't need to be the hardest person, working person that you know. Okay, um, so the question is, how, does, how do we live in this resurrection power? We've talked about how it is how powerful it is, different things about it. What, what does it look like to live in it? And that comes to the, or come, makes us come to our final point, that the power of the resurrection shapes your entire life and how you should live. In other words, there's a resurrection ethic to the Christian life. If you haven't heard that word before, an ethic is just a set of things that are right and wrong. Things that you should do, things that you shouldn't do. It's a set of morals. That's all that means. All right, so we see this in verse 49. It says this, Just as we have bor uh, borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Um, this looks at first like it's just saying that you only bear now the image of Adam, but you look forward to bearing the image of Christ, which in some sense is true. We still have perishable bodies. We're still waiting for this 
glorious, imperishable, un, undying, eternal body that we get to share with Jesus. But there's also a sense in which this has already taken place. And I want you to, to uh, turn to Colossians 3. It's on page 984 if you're looking at your Black Pew Bible. And um, it's a few books ahead. You got 2 Corinthians, and then you got uh, an easy way to remember the order of this is Gentiles each eat pork chops. <laughs> it's Gal Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Easy way to remember it. <laughs> Gentiles eat pork chops. Uh, all right. And as you're turning there, uh, focus on the language and the wording that Paul uses to describe the Christian life in light of the resurrection. So I'm just going to read a few verses from, from Colossians chapter 3. Um, and it says this. If then... So this is verses one through two. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. And then skipping down to verse nine, I'll read verses nine through 12. It says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So you, you get this statement right at the beginning of this uh, chapter that you, if then you have been raised with Christ, it frames the resurrection in, in the past, not just in the future, a future hope. It's something that's already happened to you. How does that work? Well, what Paul is getting at is that uh, you, while you're still waiting for this resurrection body at the, when Christ returns, you do have, you have been internally raised to new life in Christ. Your heart, mind, and soul have been brought to new life in Jesus. And so there is a, there's an already fulfilled part of this promise of the resurrection. And what this means is you've already been given uh, an part of this inheritance, this new nature. And the whole Christian life then is learning how to live in this new nature. In other words, everything that you do as a, as a believer is about the resurrection. Every, the, the resurrection is the center of the Christian life. And all Christian morals of right and wrong are resurrection morals. It's another way to phrase it. But here's the question. If, if that's true, that you've been raised to new life in your heart, what does that mean? Do you, do you really believe that this resurrection power is in you? Do you realize that this power, which is more powerful than any force in existence, is residing in you, at work in you powerfully to transform you more and more into the image of Jesus. That's what Romans 8.29 says, that day by day we are conformed more and more to the image of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Do you believe that that's true? I um, think that a lot of times we can earn, internalize belief, the belief that Maybe my heart hasn't been raised to new life. And we can catch ourselves getting caught up in the negativity of this world is all there is. There, there is no resurrection. Or, uh, we get caught up in, in just the cares of this world. And we don't think that change in our hearts or in our lives is possible. Um, I've caught myself with thinking this way with certain... Um, struggles I've had with, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever struggled with the fruit of the spirit self-control, <laughs> uh, or if you've ever had a, a bad habit that you struggle to, to get over, and it's really tempting in those moments to think, I'm just never going to get over this bad habit. It's, it's going to consume my life. That just is what it is. There's nothing I can do about it. One of the amazing things about believing in the resurrection power that is in you is it leads you more and more to believe no, I, I can change this. I have the most powerful force in existence living in me. 
I can, no matter how many times I fail, I can change this. Christ is changing me. That's why I know I, I can change. And there's not a pressure here. I don't want you to hear that. It's not as though if you fail to, as Paul says, set your mind on things above, to, to look to Christ. A lot of times you're going to fail to do that. I know I do. You get caught up in the cares of this world. You get caught up in believing that this world is all there is, or at least living like that. When you catch yourself doing that, the, the proper response is not to give in to despair, but to look back at just how sure you're standing in Christ is, that he is reigning in heaven on your behalf right now. Remind yourself of how powerful Christ's righteousness in your life is. Remind yourself of those truths. That's, that's really what this is about. That's what it means to set your mind on things above. Okay. I want to draw just one quick application and give you a challenge before I end. That having a resurrection ethic also involves having a resurrection vision. Here's what I mean by that. It means seeing one another as believers in Christ as, not just as they are, but as they will be and as God is making them to be. Here's the cool thing. Any sin issue that you perceive in another person's life, they're not always going to be like that. If they're, if they're a brother or sister in Christ, whatever, if there's something that you feel hurt by or something that you feel um, annoyed by or just something, another, we can really clash and disagree and rub each other the wrong way. Those sin issues in our lives that cause that conflict are temporary. They're not going to work like that in, in heaven. Not, whatever you might struggle with or someone else struggles with, however they've hurt you, that's not permanent. That's really important to remember. And I think it helps us to learn how to forgive and seek peace with other believers. And I think an example of this is uh, that it's, it's really important to think of what is temporal and what is eternal in any given conflict or disagreement that you have with another believer. Uh, an example of this in my own ministry, working with college students, young adults, is... Um, there's a lot of disagreements. A lot of times I've seen disagreements happen of what movies are appropriate to watch, what TV shows are appropriate to watch, what video games are appropriate to play, um, what entertainment we should be consuming. And all these things are important things to talk about and important things to think through. It's good to be mindful of what entertainment you're exposing yourself to. But at the same time, we have to broaden our perspective that pretty much all the entertainment of this world is temporal. It's not going to make it to the new heavens and new earth. There's going to be way better entertainment in heaven. <laughs> in comparison, most of the things in this earth are going to probably bore us. So when you have, like in, in my area of ministry, if you have disagreements about these kinds of things, we've had issues where, you're, you know, multiple times where it's happened where just a lack of discernment or we had, had a disagreement we didn't realize we had. We, we play like a TV show or we watch a movie or something like that or play a game and someone is like, well, I don't think that's appropriate to play. And there's, there's a, um, an offense there. There's, there's suddenly a tension between those two people. And I think this resurrection vision has something to say to both sides of that. But those of, on the side of, I feel like this is not okay. We should not be looking at, you know, playing this game or watching this movie as a believer. There's a realization like, yeah, there's probably a lack of discernment there, but this was a mistake. And in the grand scheme of things, my relationship with this believer in Christ is eternal. And so instead of seeing that person as my enemy, I can look at them and see them as my eternal ally, my, my eternal friend. And similarly, when you're on the other side, if you're like, ah, what's the big deal? It's just a movie. It's just a, it's just a video game. It's just this. It's just a form of entertainment. Maybe so. In, in some sense, that's true. It's, it's, it's just a board game. It's just a video game. It's just whatever it is. But is it really a big deal also if you just stop playing that game for the sake of your brother or sister in Christ? Like, in both cases, the call of the resurrection is to move towards one another as we grow more and more like Christ, realizing what is eternal and what is temporal, and not sacrificing the eternal 
for the temporal. Now, I'm not saying there are times where it is appropriate to, it, it's going to happen. You're going to lose friendships. You're going to lose relationships because you're standing on the truth of the gospel. That's real because the gospel is eternal, right? And there are times where you're going to have to um, make tough decisions about how you're going to confront someone in a relationship or a friendship. But I think the thing I want to end with is this question. It seems that to me that there's really oftentimes more agreement between the world and the church about what the church can do and what the church is than there is agreement between believers. It's really, I see this happen a lot, and it's really tempting in my heart to get into strong disagreements with other believers about how this ministry should look, how we should run this program, what we should do next, what, what's our vision for the church, and all these things. And those things do matter. Don't get me wrong. But I think there might be a problem if we find ourselves agreeing more with the world about the weakness of the church, about what the church can't do, than agreeing with other believers about what the church can do. And what this means for your life is be willing to speak up to the world. If you're willing to be confrontational with believers, sometimes you've got to be willing to be confrontational with the world. You've got to be willing to speak up, to say, speak the gospel into people's lives. And this doesn't always mean handing out gospel tracts or um, open-air preaching. I think that can be scary to a lot of people. What this can mean is simply the next time a coworker or an unbelieving friend or neighbor asks you, hey, how was your weekend? You can say, well, I went to church and just had this amazing service and it was really nourishing to my soul and really, it was, it was just an incredible experience. Like, you can say that. I don't, I don't hear people say that very often. And if you do, that's great. But we need more of that, of just openly being honest about your spiritual life to other people. Talk about it just like you would talk about what you watched on TV last night or what you watched uh, or, or, you know, who you went out with for, you know, dinner a couple days ago. Talk about devotions that you've had, quiet times maybe if you feel comfortable. Or talk about Bible studies that you've joined. There's all sorts of ways to boldly speak with conviction into the world. Doesn't always mean speaking with a louder voice. A lot of times it just means starting to talk about it. Just talk about the gospel. Talk about your faith. Talk about the resurrection. Okay. Gone way over time, so I'm going to close us in prayer now. Father, we're just so grateful for the power of the resurrection that is living in us. And Father, I pray that you would get, grant us a vision for that resurrection power more and more each day, that we would get a sense of just how powerful the resurrection is and what it can do in our lives, and that we would not underestimate what you can do through us and the power that we wield. Lord, I pray that we would wield it for good. I pray that we would bless one another with this great power and to seek to be a, a force for good in life, Lord, in the world. And I pray for conviction that we would be bold in the way we talk about our faith and that we would be willing to be confrontational in a good way, in a life-giving way, in a gentle way, in a humble way, but in a confident way. Not putting our confidence in anything that's in us, but putting our confidence in you. Father, would that be our cry and our prayer today? We just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing together. Christ the true and better Adam, Son of God and Son of Man.
is a benediction, a blessing from God for you, uh, a heavenly resource built upon the resurrection, meant to bless you and give you life. Listen to these words now from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.